Hi folks, just giving a little bit of time here for people to get into the room and then we'll get started with an introduction to One Health, which I'm sure most of you have heard more than once before. Well, I'm going to get started with my introduction. Welcome to the fifth One Health seminar of the spring semester. Almost down to the wire here. The semester is winding down within the next couple of weeks. Uh, One Health, we're still going strong here. So we've, we've got another great speaker tonight. For those of you who may not be familiar with the One Health concept here at Del Val, we really look at this as recognizing the fact that we're all on one planet. Um, you know, there's people, but there's also a dependency upon the environment, a dependency on the interactions with the animal life on the planet as well. And certainly they are dependent upon us to a great extent, given our numbers and um, how we really dominate this planet. The One Health concept is also looking at this from more of a socio-ecological model as well and recognizing that it often takes a transdisciplinary approach to solve most of the problems that we face, whether that's at a local level or whether it's at a national or international level. Uh, and the best way I think to describe this is just that it's good to be able to listen to others, hear what they have to say, get their point of view. Uh, if you do, you come up with a much better solution than you do staying within your own a particular silo or your own particular discipline. Uh, and if you're a wildlife person, it's kind of important to understand the social implications of activities or to understand the economic components of things. And, uh, vice versa, these all go back and forth amongst each other. And so I think that Del Val's uh, student body is a good representation of all the different disciplines and, and we're small enough that we should recognize how important it is to work together. Let me try to get to my next slide. And so some of the ways that we look at this is, is really through education. And then if you're at Del Val, within your first year, you've had an introduction to the One Health concept. Uh, hopefully you've been introduced to the One Health Seminar Series as well. We incorporated across a number of courses. We have a One Health Communications minor. If you don't know where that, please get in contact with me. I'd be happy to talk to you about it uh, or any of our folks from the English department as well. Uh, research is another component reaching across the island and we have a great student research program and I strongly encourage students to get together and come up with ideas because it truly is student research, not that you're doing our research. And then finally, outreach. And for the community members that we may have on tonight, welcome. Always love to have our folks from the neighborhood come on and people from across the country for that matter or anywhere in the country. Um, the One Health concept is something that we wanna spread and I think that the variety of presentations that we provide each semester are a good indication of, you know, it's not just one topic, it's a bunch of different topics that fit into this. And many of my students would be very quick to say, well, actually One Health is everything. And that's really what I, I feel like it is too, that uh, we just involve every discipline within this. So at this point, I would like to introduce our fabulous speaker for this evening. We've got Dr. Rachel Besner Kerr with us this evening. Uh, she is a professor in global development at Cornell University and does research in Africa on sustainable agriculture, gender, climate change adaptation, food security, and nutrition. Does that cover most of our disciplines? I think a good portion of them. <laughs> 
Uh, she has published over 100 peer-reviewed scientific papers. She was a coordinating lead author for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I'm teaching a climate change course right now, and certainly everybody in that class is uh, well aware of that group as well. Uh, in 2022, Impacts, Adaptation, and Vulnerability, Chapter 5. Dr. Besner Kerr also served as a member of the high-level panel of experts for the United Nations Committee for Food, World Food Security, co-authoring the 2019 report on agroecology. Well, um, I think that you really have hit on a lot of a lot of areas for our students, and I certainly welcome you and thank you so much for appearing with us tonight. Thank you so much for that uh, lovely introduction, and I'm really delighted to be here. I, it's great to hear about the One Health program. It's uh, really speaking my language, uh, so I'm really excited to talk to you today. I'm going to talk about agroecological approaches to sustainable food systems. So to do that, I'm going to give a brief overview of what I mean. Oh, there's someone raising their hand. Um, yeah, I'll check into that. Okay, um, I'm going to give a brief overview of what I mean by agroecology, and I'll also be touching on some of the core findings from oops uh, from um, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as it relates to the food system. Uh, so agroecology is like One Health; it's a holistic concept, and it's it's really a an approach to food production and food systems that tries to use both ecological and social principles. And as it, it not only uh, encompasses a set of practices, but it's also a scientific endeavor of bringing together agronomy and ecology along with the social uh, justice principles. So at the farm level, you can think about principles such as fostering biodiversity, um, at the farm and landscape level, I should say, uh, fostering biodiversity, um, uh, uh, strengthening soil health, building synergies between plants and animals within the farm system, encouraging recycling of en energy, nutrients, and water, and supporting animal health and welfare, along with reducing reliance on fossil fuel-based and toxic inputs. Um, but as uh, an, a holistic approach to food production, agroecology goes beyond the farm and field level and really thinks about the food system as a whole. And so some of the principles that are agroecological include co-creation of scientific knowledge around food systems. So food producers and scientists working together to address uh, problems, building connectivity between producers and consumers, ensuring that the food system addresses social values and uh, nutritional needs in communities and uh, produces healthy diets uh, and sort of democratizing the food system, allowing everyone to have a say in how food gets produced and uh, who produces it. And also addressing questions of access to land, access to and control over seeds and water. And so these are the broader um, dimensions of of uh, agroecological principles. And so it, it go, really goes beyond trying to grow food ecologically to thinking about having a, a food system that addresses health, nutrition, social, and um, economic needs uh, of, of uh, food producers and consumers. And a key component of agroecology, and this, this also aligns with what uh, Reg was describing in terms of the One Health approach, is this co-learning, this co-development of knowledge around food, around food systems. And so this includes drawing on indigenous and local knowledge and using participatory methodologies to address problems within the food system. Uh, so this is a, really a, a core component of agroecology. As part of my uh, work on the UN high-level panel of experts for the Committee for World Food Security, that's a mouthful, um, we did an assessment of the literature on whether agroecology can actually deliver in terms of food security and nutrition. And uh, this is an approach that's been operating for several decades, but the question that was really skeptically put to us was, is, is there evidence that it can actually improve food security and nutrition? So we reviewed um, 
thousands of articles, and we found a subset that addressed this question of whether agroecological practices can improve uh, food security and nutrition. And we found that 78% of them showed evidence of positive outcomes in terms of food security and nutrition. And uh, only one showed negative outcomes and the, the rest showed mixed, both positive and, and negative outcomes. And what we found was the more complex the agroecological system, so not just one practice such as crop diversification, but really a combination of practices, including these more social political aspects such as farmer to farmer teaching and learning, these were more likely to have positive food security and nutrition outcomes. Okay, so that's a brief overview of what agroecology is. And I'll come back to it as we go through different examples because it may seem somewhat abstract at this point. Um, Reg mentioned that I served on the um, IPCC and I was privileged enough to uh, coordinate, co-coordinate the chapter on food systems, looking at climate change impacts, uh, vulnerability and adaptation within the food system. And this report was released just as the a war, uh, the conflict in the Ukraine uh, 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 happened. And so you may not have noticed the headlines, but the, just to summarize, we found strong, robust evidence uh, reviewing the literature from the past seven years, the scientific literature, strong evidence that climate change was already impacting food production systems and having uh, subsequent impacts on food security and nutrition globally. And we have a robust list of the different ways that climate change is impacting food systems. We also found, however, that there are many effective and feasible adaptation options in food systems that also meet other goals. So not just reducing risk to climate change, but also meeting other goals. And while uh, farmers and food producers and governments are adapting to climate change in food systems, they tend to be doing so incrementally at a single sector level and not at the kind of transformational level that's required given what we know in terms of climate change impacts. And we also found there, there is robust evidence that taking an ecosystem-based approach to food systems such as agroecology support food security as well as these other, as well as many other benefits. And I'll, I'll come back to that. And importantly, adaptation strategies need to be inclusive and really involve those groups most impacted and who may be already socially marginalized within food systems. So these include low income groups, um, uh, small scale food producers, indigenous peoples, and uh, farm workers. So involving them from the start in adaptation strategies is really crucial to avoid uh, the adaptation strategy worsening outcomes for them. Some of the adaptation options that we reviewed, um, and we reviewed a, a whole host of them in the literature, include the, the most common that people think about in food systems is changing the seeds, changing the crop varieties. And cultivar improvements do reduce climate risks, but there are many other strategies that can be taken and more often at the, at the kind of landscape level or at the, the regional level rather than just at the farm level. Some of these include agroforestry systems, agroecosystem diversification, community-based adaptation, which in really involves involving a whole community and developing a strategy and agroecological approaches. And many of these strategies provide other benefits besides reducing climate risk, such as supporting livelihoods, supporting health and well-being, and importantly, supporting the ecosystems and bio biodiversity that support food systems in turn. So things like pollinators, water quality, um, and uh, natural enemies that eat pests, for example. And uh, Addressing social inequities in food systems is crucial if we want to have adaptation strategies mm -hmm. that really work uh, and, and don't marginalize uh, people further. So oftentimes in food systems, more technical approaches are, are thought of as the strategy to address the climate risks. So for example, irrigation is a very common strategy that uh, governments and um, uh, other uh, 
uh, private sector and farmers think of as, as a way to deal with climate risk. But without paying attention to who benefits from that technical strategy, who has access to it, who has control over it, um, and what some of the ecological and social outcomes might be from in, in introducing that technology, uh, it can actually lead to worse outcomes, both in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but also in terms of um, vulnerability for particular social groups. And so taking a really integrated approach, similar to the One Health approach, is really crucial if we're going to transform our food system for being resilient to climate change risks. And some of those integrated approaches mean looking at diet choices as well as the food production end. So not just thinking about how we're producing food, but thinking about addressing things like food waste and what kinds of foods we're, produ we're producing. And in the IPCC report, we found robust evidence that these ecosystem-based approaches such as agroecology reduce climate risk as well as supporting these other benefits. Um, so these include in terms of ecosystem services, things like pest control, uh, buffering of extreme temperatures and carbon sequestration and storage. So you really get these multiple benefits from taking this more holistic approach that takes into account kind of ecosystems and biodiversity. So what does this really look like? It still sounds quite abstract, I think, from, from your perspective, I, I suspect. And so um, I'm going to go through a number of examples uh, from, the, from the scientific literature, and then I will give you an example from my own research in Africa. So first of all, a sort of integrated approach would include supporting local producers to produce more diverse foods so not just producing one grain or one animal, but producing multiple crops and animals on a farm and across a landscape, and then supporting them to find markets. So building capacity for those producers to diversify their farms through um, supporting things like cooperatives, uh, uh, allowing for public procurement um, for um, purchasing food from these diverse producers and giving it or uh, uh, pro providing it to schools and hospitals and other public institutions, universities, um, and and then diversifying the foods that kids are eating in school meals through homegrown um, producers. So it's it's kind of supporting uh, more diversification of foods at multiple scales and at multiple points in the food system. Another example from a, a kind of coastal perspective, so maybe not something that one thinks about when you're in upstate New York, but an important um, food source for many communities across the world is thinking about community-based mangrove restoration on coastal uh, communities, which supports um, resilience to extreme events such as storm surges and floods, but also provides an important habitat for fisheries and um, bolsters uh, biodiversity in those coastal systems and can also be an important source of mitigation for greenhouse gas emissions. So you have this multiple benefit uh, happening again. It does require training and support and sometimes conflicts with other livelihood strategies. So trade-offs have to be made. Uh, for example, shrimp aquaculture can conflict with coastal mangrove restoration, but this is an example of what a kind of ecosystem-based adaptation strategy might look like on, in a coastal system. And I'll tell you the next one if it lets me switch. Another example is silvopastoral systems. So integrating animals and trees into, uh, into a producer system. And this provides shade for animals. So it actually can improve their health and it can increase their productivity. You can also get products from the trees which then can be a source of livelihood for the producer, but also can mitigate risk if your animals aren't doing as well one year or the prices aren't as good one year, you may benefit from the tree crop that you're growing, for example. And again, you have carbon sequestration. Um, so you have these multiple benefits as well. The manure from the animals can improve the soil health. And so you get this kind of ecosystem service benefit um, that, that uh, happens in civil pastoral systems. 
It does require ca capacity building and real shift in the way animals are, are raised and may need new infrastructure support. And you may need to do develop markets for this kind of um, meat production. Another example of what uh, sort of ecosystem-based adaptation in the food system might look like in an urban setting is supporting urban gardens in low-income neighborhoods. Urban agriculture, uh, we did a review of the literature for the IPCC report, and it doesn't necessarily serve as a climate change adaptation strategy. It may be quite energy intensive, depending on how um, plants and animals are being raised in the city. Um, and it may be only serving um, high income households, again, depending on where it's placed and what kinds of foods are being produced and how it's being produced. But there is strong literature to support that if it's placed in low income neighborhoods carefully with their input into where are good locations, and if there is capacity building around uh, gardening and interest in gardening amongst low income dwellers in that region, and if uh, there's uh, support for developing local markets, it can both increase the amount of diverse fruits and vegetables largely available to low-income households in urban settings, which is a sort of a side benefit, if you will, not related to climate risk, but important for um, health and well-being. It can provide cooling during heat waves, which is important, particularly in low-income neighborhoods um, in the United States, but also in other, other uh, regions of the world where many low-income neighborhoods have less green spaces for cooling. And it also has this other uh, benefit. Oh, it, it can provide a source of um, water capture, so reduce runoff during flooding events. But it can also foster things like social networks and build community uh, networks uh, in uh, these neighborhoods and so provide important social interactions and mental health uh, benefits, as well as potential source of livelihood for people. So it has these multiple benefits while uh, providing uh, strategy for climate impacts. And of course, there are challenges. So you have uh, some sites where you have contaminated soil from previous industrial use. Um, the cost of land, access to land is, is a problem in, in many cities and often requires public support in order to ensure access to land. And then um, you need um, capacity building often in, in food production. Uh, another example of, and this is a, really an agroecological strategy, an agroecological set of practices is agroecosystem diversification. So this is a whole host of different practices in farming that diversify the, the plants, uh, you know, in, in a farm system. Some of them are crops and some of them are not crops. So you can have mixed planting or intercrops, you can have crop rotation, you can have diversified management on the field margins. So you can have uh, hedgerows, you can have flowers, uh, you can integrate crops and, and livestock together, and uh, you can have agroforestry. These are all forms of agroecosystem diversification. And all of these strategies can regulate and support ecosystem services, such as soil improving soil fertility, improving pollination, buffering of temperature extremes, reducing risk of crop loss, and supporting uh, nutrient cycling. And this isn't a strategy only for um, small scale producers in Africa, where I do most of my research. It's also important in North America and Europe and other areas where you have larger scale uh, production systems. So one study in Canada, for example, found that just diversifying the crop rotation rather than having corn only, improved yield over time, yield stability, and increased soil organic carbon under multiple climate scenarios for the future. So this agroecosystem diversification would need to be adjusted based on the cropping system, the agroecosystem, the markets, uh, you know, farmer interest, a, a whole host of different things that would need to have adapted to that given context and assessed for the trade-offs that were being made, but there's very robust evidence. There's 
meta reviews of meta reviews of agroecosystem diversification, having these multiple benefits. And I, I didn't include it here, but we just had a paper, I, I was one of the co-authors of a paper that was just published last week in Science that showed further evidence of biodiversity having these multiple positive social and ecological benefits in farming systems. And there are a lot of barriers uh, to um, agroecosystem diversification. It sounds simple, just increasing the number of plants and animals in a farming system, but there are a lot of policy disincentives subsidies that encourage you to grow one thing or raise one animal. Uh, there's limited research and investment in this approach to farming. So this uh, approach to having diverse diversity across a, a farming system. And alongside that, less access to seeds, less access to infrastructure and markets. And so there, there needs to be more capacity building amongst food producers to be able to manage a more complex system than, than just growing one crop or raising one animal. Um, but there has been research looking at strategies to support food producers to make this shift and things like shifting subsidies so that they support diversified production, public procurement for diversified pro products, um, supporting shorter regional value chains through things like uh, food hubs, um, agrotourism, and then payments for ecosystem services. These are all strategies to support uh, diversified farming systems. Okay, so that's kind of big picture and some examples from the literature um, in, in the kind of global uh, picture. And now I'm going to change gears and talk about my research in Malawi and Tanzania, um, where I have been doing long-term research with smallholder farmers and with multiple different scientists, nutritionists, agronomists, um, uh, geographers, ecologists, looking at the potential for agroecology under smallholder farming systems. And I'm gonna review um, a set of studies we've done in Malawi and Tanzania, where farmers experimented with these different agroecological strategies. So things like agroforestry, intercropping legumes, such as pigeon pea and groundnut, and then rotating that with maize, which is the primary staple in this region. The use of compost and more intensive use of animal manure crop diversification, so introducing things like reintroducing really sorghum and finger millet, which are both indigenous grains that used to be more commonly grown in the region. And then throughout these experiments, farmer to farmer learning and exchanges to share what they're learning about their experiments. And alongside the agronomic, the sort of agricultural experiments, we also paid attention to the uh, different factors that affect nutrition and social well-being. So we um, developed community-based strategies for addressing gender inequity, which was a factor we found uh, prohibited improvement of food security and nutrition and was quite high. Gender inequity was quite high in terms of the division of labor and decision making in both Malawi and Tanzania and uh, addressing child nutrition, as well as <clears throat> being attention to climate change as a, as a factor. So we did a whole host of other studies on these, uh, on these issues of climate change, gender inequity, and nu child nutrition, and then developed different uh, educational strategies to share what we learned. And by we, I mean nonprofit organizations in Malawi, uh, as well as uh, a range of different scientists. And we developed educational strategies that included uh, theater and um, storytelling, small group discussions and um, hands-on activities. And we tested those in alongside the agroecological experiments. And we found our studies uh, demonstrated that agroecological practices significantly improved food security and dietary diversity. So um, it varied by study which practices mattered. Crop diversity and compost application were consistent across studies. And then the other practices varied by study. Um, so for example, we found that women's dietary diversity had improved in Malawi and the overall household food security had improved. In Tanzania, we found that children had improvements in their uh, dietary diversity. 
And we found that there were multiple pathways that households were improving their food security. It wasn't only that they were growing more foods and then eating those foods, they were doing things like improving their soil health and then not having to spend as much money on fertilizer and using that money to invest in things like dry season vegetable gardens or in livestock. Um, and they were also saving money on foods that they had previously purchased and they were using that money to invest in things like livestock. Uh, and so our studies found that households using these different agroecological practices significantly improved their income. And they also no longer had to, reported no longer having to work on other people's farms uh, because they produced enough of their own foodstuffs that they didn't have to resort to working on other people's, other people's farms during the growing season, which is a common strategy in Malawi and Tanzania for food insecure households. And they were able to use that time to invest in their own food production. So it was this kind of virtuous circle where they found that they were improving their food security. And this allowed them to then invest more time in getting better uh, food production practices. And as well, they did they they increased the amount of food and seed sharing in their own communities. So there was this kind of wider community uh, benefit. In all cases, we found that gender relations really mattered for agroecological impacts. So for example, in Malawi, we found that when farmers discussed with their spouse different decisions about food production, they were more likely to improve their food security and dietary diversity. And in the Tanzanian case, we found that those households that were participating in the agroecological intervention were more likely to, men were more likely to help in household work, uh, things like cooking and laundry, and that this was significantly associated with a reduction in women's likelihood of depression. So um, it had mental health benefits as well as uh, nutritional benefits. And our studies found that farmers increased their knowledge about ways to improve soil quality and uh, prepare diverse foods and address pests and diseases and improve soil uh, health. And that this placed them in, better, uh, can, in a better uh, situation in the case of a drought. Um, so they were more prepared to cope with drought and they were more organized and, and were sharing more knowledge around strategies to deal with climate change adaptation. We went back in the one case of uh, where we worked with 6,000 farmers in northern and central Malawi to assess impact after the intervention had finished. And we found that farmers were still, the majority of farmers were still using these practices. And uh, that if they had participated in these different farmer to farmer learning activities, they were more likely to be using more um, practices. Nonetheless, there are many um, political and economic challenges to you, an agroecological approach, including um, longstanding unequal access to land and a sort of international environment where monocropped um, intensified agriculture is being heavily promoted both by um, governments and by private sector actors. And um, this uh, the, another challenge is finding good markets for more agroecologically produced food, given the increased concentration on the retail side as well. Uh, this also makes it challenging for farmers. Um, and I mentioned already some of the different strategies that can be used to support agroecological transitions, um, including diverting of subsidies and Im implementing policies that support um, agroecological transitions, including capacity building, um, public procurement, and um, training in, in extension work. So um, just to conclude, um, from the IPCC, we know that uh, adaptation to climate change is happening in food systems, but it isn't happening at a transformational level or um, uh, enough, uh, quickly enough. But there are many feasible and effective adaptation strategies in food systems that can be taken. And many of those uh, adaptation strategies that are feasible and effective take this kind of ecosystem-based approach to uh, adaptation. And agroecology is one such approach.
which le uh, there's evidence that it can improve food security and nutrition while also improving the ecosystem on which uh, food is produced and biodiversity and uh, household well-being. And um, in the research from Malawi and Tanzania, uh, we found that addressing sort of questions of gender and other social inequities and integrating um, nutrition education was important for having food security and nutrition outcomes as well as significant social impacts. But to ensure a longer term and broader transformation and building resilience within the food system more broadly, there needs to be improved policy support in terms of subsidies, in terms of public procurement programs, and addressing some of these broader social inequities, such as access to land and um, building local economies that support more diversified food systems. So with that, I just want to acknowledge that all of the research I do is in collaboration with many different uh, scientists and farmers and um, nonprofit organizations and are funded by a number of different organizations, both public and uh, private foundations. And I also want to acknowledge my fellow team members from the IPCC for the report findings that I presented uh, towards the beginning of the talk. And with that, I think I'm open for questions. Yeah, folks, if you will go ahead and put your questions into the Q&A. Actually, we've got one coming up. And uh, I, Rachel, will go ahead and read the questions to you so you don't have to worry about following along with what's going up on the screen. Uh, Anonymous asks, are there studies to further show the public that economically this is better for people to do all around and not just some hippie thinking? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a, a great question. There have been some studies looking at the economics of, of an agroecological approach, and it, there is evidence that it does have positive outcomes in terms of economic, um, in terms of farmer incomes and other measures, economic measures. There was a study that um, uh, was just published uh, two weeks ago on this. It, it's a challenging question though, because the current food production system is supporting a very different approach to growing food. And so in that context, it's very hard for a farmer who's trying to you know, use agroecological practices to survive economically. So in the current context, it's, it's pretty tough to, to manage it. Um, without more policy support. And that's very context dependent. I don't know if I've answered your question. I've got a rather strange question for you, Rachel. I don't, um, do you feel like that potentially within the areas that you've worked that colonial rule actually moved agriculture away from practices that were probably better for the communities towards practices that are we're now trying to change back to polyculture and and something that has a, a bit more resilience to it that is such a great question um i i do i've actually studied that in malawi um and i i teach about food systems so i i study a lot of history of different uh global south countries so Yes, by and large, uh, colonial um, rule encouraged monocultures. Um, oftentimes, they took land away uh, from uh, local producers and they installed plantations. So sugarcane, of course, cotton, um, uh, you know, wheat, um, uh, tea, but and and intensified production, you know, long before synthetic fertilizer, uh, the kind of plantation system was developed under um, the slave trade and then under colonial rule. So under a course of you know forced labor. Um, but at the same time, in places where the colonial governments were not uh, taking over the land for plantation agriculture, they were often very focused on getting 
local producers to grow one thing for their purposes. So um, whether it was, you know, in, in Malawi, they got pretty focused on corn. So corn, of course, is not native to Africa. Um, it came in with the Portuguese. Um, uh, it's been there for 500 years. So people think of it as a local crop. But under the British colonial rule, it was heavily promoted um, by, the, by the colonial government for smallholders uh, in order to provide food for their mines, their plantation workers, their colonial, uh, you know, uh, workers. And so they did encourage moving away from polycultures, moving away from uh, these, uh, you know, uh, these more healthy agroecological practices towards kind of intensive one crop producing systems. Uh, and I was really interested in the idea of payments for ecosystem services. Uh, any thoughts on how the, that might be implemented here in the United States, for example? Well, it is actually already being implemented. Um, and it's not my area of expertise, but I do know, you know that there are um, practices that you can do that you can get you know, paid uh, for um, by the government um, that do have ecological benefits such as cover crops. Um, I know that they're in, in New York, they're exploring agroforestry systems where you can get payments for ecosystem services um, because you know they, they have these multiple benefits. Um, but I think it's not being done at a scale enough that uh, it, it, it really has that like wide wide reaching benefit. but um, the idea is that you know there is a public benefit for you doing these practices on your land that go well beyond what you as a as a landowner would actually benefit from, whether it's carbon sequestration, whether it's improving water quality, reducing flooding, you know, there's there's many different things that you might do on your land that have these wide reaching benefits. So the idea is that there is yeah, payment and acknowledgement that you you do those things. How it happens in reality, you know, that is where there are often challenges from the paperwork involved, getting, yeah. you know, getting Knowing instructed. About it in the first place. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um yeah, getting it getting it approved in the first place. And then um yeah, how it gets rolled out. Some of those details then can be quite challenging. So we have another question from Nicholas, a follow-up to that question of colonize, co colonialism destroying polyculture practices to feed the capital machine by now going back as Westerners, white, to again uh, tell uh, B.I. Posey what to do. Aren't we just committing, uh, committing a new form of colonialization uh, we meddle once, now we are just meddling in others' affairs again. I love that question, Nicholas. And um, I, there is, a, um, I think it's very important to recognize that agroecological approaches, you know, many of them, many of the practices are indigenous practices. Um, and that's, you know, why I mentioned this co-production of knowledge, you know, drawing on, building on local knowledge. And so it's, it, uh, an agroecological approach shouldn't involve like going in somewhere and saying, this is what you should be doing now, but rather kind of problem solving together. And some, and, and that means using indigenous knowledge, using local experimentation and problem solving. It does also involve science. So, you know, it there can be useful insights from scientific experimentation and research that go beyond what is known um, at the, at, uh, by local indigenous people. Um, but, you know, working with Malawian and Tanzanian farmers, many of them observe, you know, many of these strategies are ones that my grandparents used to use. Um, but we've been told for, multiple decades that these are backwards, that these are, you know, uh, not modern. And, and now I'm seeing that in fact, they, they are, they are advanced. And so I'm, I'm 
they in many cases farmers are reclaiming and taking pride in practices that were previously denigrated. So I think it's, I don't know if I've answered your question, but I think it it is very important to be very cautious about assuming, you know, that sort of Western modern science has the answer and recognizing very, very problematic power dynamics that can operate in the global South context and being really respectful and uh, recognizing indigenous knowledge that preceded um, the, the scientific research on agroecology. And, and I think the farmer to farmer kind of way of getting getting messages out are, are much better. And uh, a farmer is not gonna tell his neighbor something that's, that's not something that he's actually experienced as being successful. Uh, so I think that those partnerships between the community, the scientists, uh, and and people from the country itself uh, working together, kind of helping to sign, find solutions is a much better way to go. Uh, Anne has a question. I just finished reading a book called When the Sahara Was Green. One point that the author made was that the indigenous peoples were successful in adapting to localized change, drought, flood, et cetera, by moving. Doesn't politics in the basic form, borders of countries, for instance, preclude population movement within a region? Is there a workaround for this situation? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's true that uh, in Africa, you know, many borders um, were created during the colonial period that separated people, pastoralists, for example, who had moved uh, in, in a region to adapt to drought in a, in a given place. Um, I think, you know, allowing for pastoralists to move across borders would be the workaround. I don't know how much openness there is to that in, in places where you have pastoralists in particular is where I'm thinking about the need for people to move to adapt to uh, you know, to changing um, conditions, climate conditions. Um, but yes, it is It is a challenge. So one thing that comes to my mind, Rachel, is, um, you know, great work being done by the IPCC, great work being done by the UN and many different committees that are pulling together information, uh, making suggestions on a global level, not only to deal with climate change, but with biodiversity loss and a growing population and trying to reduce poverty and sustainable development goals. Are the developing nations really looking at these recommendations and trying to modify their own strategies? In particular, I'm thinking about within the U.S., I've had past experiences with USAID, and I, I worked in West Africa, and uh, USAID being very focused on supporting industry, not necessarily in supporting the country. Uh, and I'm wondering, do we see, this is even broader, or actually more down to the local level, extension services? Are the land-grant universities really picking up on these things and trying to modify their recommendations to, to landowners? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think in the U.S. context, I think there's less, the U.S. Um, Extension Service and USAID tends to be more focused on this industrial kind of intensified agriculture approach and kind of focused on industry. But there are um, places where uh, there's more openness. I know the University of Vermont, um, they're um, uh, more focused on an agroecological approach um, in their extension and uh, they have an institute for agroecology now. Uh, so it does depend on the country. My own experience in Malawi, um, uh, you, you know, there's conflicting interests within government and external actors who are all, you know, trying to say, here's what you should do. Uh, you know, there's fertilizer companies, there's the large foundations promoting a particular 
uh, approach. There's, you know, big companies, uh, there's donors, and then there's a highly indebted country um, that, you know, is dependent on foreign aid to operate. Uh, so they're a little bit uh, hamstrung, but I do, we, we uh, collaborate a lot with Extension and with the regional governments in Malawi, and they're very excited about um, this approach and very, very keen to collaborate. And uh, we've been having increasing discussions at the national level um, to try to promote this approach and to share our findings. And there is a lot of openness uh, at the national level, but they they have a lot of constraints. I mean, a lot of constraints. So I'm sympathetic to those constraints. <laughs> Do you feel that Canada is uh, is progressing more quickly than than the U.S.? Um um, in some ways, uh, Canada takes uh, into account things like uh, gender issues more overtly in their aid programs. Um, uh, and we have received more support for this kind of approach uh, from the government of Canada. Um, but Canada also has its own strategic interests, right? It has a big fertilizer industry. So they're not really keen on the agroecology approach because agroecology explicitly aims to reduce reliance on synthetic inputs. Um, countries that are more interested are France um, and other countries in the European Union. There's a lot more research and support uh, in the in European Union than North America for whatever reason. So, Yeah, I, I... I'm afraid to say that uh, within the work that I was doing, I had had high hopes. I was working in Liberia during the Civil War, and uh, boy, once the war ended, uh, plantations came in with a vengeance, um, and the promise of jobs and money for the government. Uh, and yet now we have people who can't feed themselves because they no longer have land. Um, it's uh, it's rather frustrating. Oh, yes, very much so. Uh, Nicholas doesn't have a question here. He's just talking to me and said, will the recording be available? Absolutely. We always have recordings available after. And Nicholas, I'm so glad to see you here. And I will definitely be sending uh, you the video. And <laughs> thanks, Nicholas. Uh, any more questions? We've got just about time for for one more or so. I find this fascinating, Rachel. I I just have been with my classes trying. We're approaching it from a biodiversity side, but also uh, just the idea that you can no longer operate in your own little silos. Uh, you've got to be looking at this across, uh, well, we've got global concerns and trying to take it from those global concerns, finding ways that we can move forward and then somehow getting that transmitted down to the ground where it can actually be implemented, be for the good of the people as well as for future generations to survive as well. Mm -hmm is uh, quite a challenge. Uh, I'm sure it's really rewarding to have your work actually come out in the form of the reports from the UN and IPCC uh, and all of that research you've done. That must give you a lot of avenues that uh, you'd love to go down that uh, there's only you and only so much time, right? <laughs> it's so true. It is It is very satisfying work, but yes, it, there is, uh, it gives you also the impetus to do more, so. And Rosanna said, thank you so much. And I will add to that myself. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure having you with us. Uh, thank you all for, for attending this evening. And I know that we'll have a number of other people who will be seeing the recording and wish that they could have asked their own questions as well. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me, and I enjoyed the discussion. Thank you, Rachel. You have a great night. Everybody else have a great night as well. You too. Good night. Night.